Okay, now we're going to talk about gene transfer between different bacteria, um, and we're kind of distinguishing between two different mechanisms. Um, and those are referred to as vertical gene transfer versus horizontal gene, gene transfer. Um, and kind of the idea behind this is that uh, you, know, you can have gene transfer that occurs um, between uh, members of the same species. Um, and so, you know, an individual cell might uh, divide into two and so forth. Um, and, you know, you kind of follow this process along. And, you know, this is how members of a species are generated. So each of these keeps on generating new bacteria. You have division, and then there's genetic uh, material that kind of gets exchanged in this vertical direction. Uh, but if you allow these things to, to do this for a long enough period of time, eventually you have speciation that occurs as these um, have evolved so independently um, that they might, they might evolve to fit new niches. And so horizontal exchange occurs when there's DNA that is exchanged between members of a different species. And so they can either be closely related um, or even kind of pretty, pretty significantly distance apart. Um, and you know how how separated in evolutionary time they are depends upon the exact mode of, of transfer, and these play a significant role in the evolution of bacteria. So antibiotics is something that we discussed a bit, where we know that antibiotic resistance is something that evolves very rapidly, and so if, if the bacteria is able to pick up um, some sort of um, resistance gene from another bacteria, then it's obviously going to be at a good advantage. Um, but we also see this all the time with, you know, kind of more modular things like the ability to process a certain food source. And so, you know, some bacteria have very specialized enzymes that allow it to process a food source such as chitin, let's say. Um, so in order to, to process and use chitin, um, this is kind of the material that's used in um, crab shells, for example. Um, so if you're in the ocean, there's a large amount of chitin that's just kind of like floating um, through, through the water that just comes from, you know, dead crab, decomposing crab, etc., or kind of other shellfish, etc. And so some bacteria have, have managed to evolve enzymes that allow it to feed um, on that chitin and use that as an energy source. Um, and, you know, if a, if, a, if a species has evolved that, it can transfer those genes um, to a different bacteria um, and so that allows this bacteria that formerly was not able to process chitin as a food source now all of a sudden gains that ability. And so that bacteria is suddenly at an advantage um, compared to, to its peers and its other, other members of the species. And so that might play a key role in its own evolution. And so uh, there's all sorts of different traits um, uh, that you can think of that way. Um, where if it evolves in a single bacteria species, it can now, now be transferred um, through other species through this genetic exchange process. And so for bacteria, there's three primary uh, modes of genetic exchange. Um, one of them is called conjugation, and there's kind of two forms of conjugation. So this is listed twice on here. Um, one refers to the exchange of a plasmid, and one refers to the exchange of a uh, part of the chromosome. Transformation. Transformation is when free DNA is taken up by the cell. Um, so, you know, the cell right here might lyse and release the contents of the cytoplasm, including pieces of DNA. So the DNA will get sheared or degraded. Um, but you have these pieces that are kind of floating around in the environment and a cell might be able to take it up and then use that as, and use it, it, it suddenly has this DNA material that might encode for something that would be useful to it. Uh, and so then it has methods in order to, to, to take that DNA and, and exchange it with its chromosome. And then finally, viruses. Um, so viruses, phages that infect bacteria cells, um, in some cases can package um, parts of the DNA um, into, the, into the viral head. And so when it goes on to infect a new cell, it actually is, instead of injecting the viral genome, it injects um, part of the bacterial genome. And so this is another method of, of exchange that can occur. So uh, we are first going to talk about conjugation, which occurs through this bridge. Um, so you can see that there's actually this physical bridge that is getting built um, between uh, these, these different cells. And so we'll start off with the F factor, um, which is F for fertility factor. 
and it allows for the unidirectional transfer of genetic material. Um, so one cell is, is able to transfer genetic material to the other cell, um, but this is kind of a one-way process. So the other cell is not able to transfer back. And so the cells that are F-positive serve as DNA donors. Um, F-minus cells, those are the recipients, and so that's how we distinguish them. So, you know, you have an F-plus cell. Um, it is able to build this bridge through something called a pilus or pili, and it bridges on to this F-minus cell. So the F-minus cell doesn't have to do anything for this bridge to latch onto it, and so now all of a sudden you have the ability to transfer DNA from this F plus cell um, to the F minus cell. So E. coli may or may not contain the F factor, and if the F factor is present, then the cell forms the sex pillus, um, which is kind of that bridge um, that serves as the donor of genetic information. So the DNA actually gets transported um, through these pili um, into the other cell. And one thing about this process is that it's transformative, um, so it kind of acts like a virus. Um, so you know, if you think about the matrix, you know, reloaded, um, you know, you know uh, Agent Smith is able to touch another individual and transform that individual to another copy of itself. And so that's kind of how the F factor works. So the F plus cell not only transfers DNA, um, from one cell to the other, but it actually converts the recipient into an F-positive state. So after this process occurs, um, this individual is now able to also generate the sex pill I, um, and it gets converted into an F-positive cell. So how does this work? Um, this works because the F-factor is a plasmid, um, so this is a small piece of DNA, and it encodes genes on this plasmid that instruct the cell how to build the pillus. Um, so there's genes that are components of it, so these are actual like physical components, like the bricks um, that are used to build it, um, and also kind of instructions on how and when to do it. So you know, there's a large number of genes that are actually encoded on this plasmid. So once this F plus cell comes into contact with an F minus cell, um, conjugation has occurred, and so now there's this bridge um, between which DNA can flow. So what gets transferred is the um, plasmid itself, and not just a, the entire plasmid, it's a, you know, which is a double-stranded piece of DNA, um, but only a single strand um, of DNA. So one strand of that plasmid is nicked, and so you create a linear strand, so you have two strands of DNA. Um, you know, and typically, that's the worst double helix I've ever seen in my life. Um, and so typically they form a double helix. And so what happens is one of those strands is nicked. And so instead of being a circular um, strand, it now converts to a linear strand. So this second strand is still circular, um, but this strand is now linear. Um, so I'm just plugging it with that And so that linear strand is actually um, transported through the pillus into the second cell, into that F minus cell. Um, at the same time, uh, DNA is synthesized um, on both strands, and so as a result, after the transfer, you have two double-stranded copies of the plasmid. So simultaneous with transfer is synthesis, um, so it creates two copies of the plasmid at the same time. And then this moves across the cell, and then once synthesis is complete, the conjugates separate. So you lose that bridge, you know, closes, and so now we have two different cells. But of course, this new cell also has the F the plasmid, and so now it's been converted into an F plus cell. Um, so, you know, why is the plasmid transferred? So this is a very active process. So you know, we said that there's all sorts of genes that are included on the plasmid. You know, you might have the brick, you might have the, the DNA replication, you might have, you know, what's required for ligase, for, for separating it. And then you also have like a small piece of the DNA, and that basically specifies where the DNA is nicked and then transferred. And so that is called the origin of transfer, and it's also been just designated as ORET.
Um, so this is, you know, a sequence that gets recognized by protein in order to start the nicking, which allows the transfer to occur. And then what, you know, there's a protein that actually binds to this and then just kind of like pumps this DNA into the new cell. And the starting point of that is actually encoded on that F factor, and that's called the OET. So this is the process of conjugation where one plasmid gets transferred to the other. Um, however, there's also a process by which part of the chromosome gets transferred. So in this case, you'll notice it's only the plasmid that gets transferred. And, you know, whatever DNA is on these chromosomes just remains within the cell. There's no way to transfer this DNA into the other cell unless um, something occurs where this plasmid actually integrates itself into the chromosome. And so what you're doing is you're taking this F-factor plasmid DNA and it actually gets inserted into the bacterial chromosome. And so now that F-factor, all those genes that are, um, that encode the coli, that encode you know, the, the, the proteins necessary for transferring it, that encode the origin of transfer, are now actually on that chromosome. And so when this process occurs, we say that an HFR cell has been created, um, and that's for high frequency of recombination. And so now, you know, these cells still encode all the stuff necessary to build the pili, and so the HFR cells are still competent to kind of transfer stuff. So what happens when it comes into contact? So a conjugate, again, is formed. So an F minus cell comes into contact with the HFR cell. The bridge is produced. But now the origin of transfer is attached to the entire chromosome. And so again, you are transferring um, a single piece of DNA um, into the cell, um, into the new cell. Um, but it, you know, you're, you're actually dealing with the chromosomes. So you're not just doing the plasmid DNA, but you're actually doing the stuff that is next to the plasmid DNA. And so that's designated by these letters A, B, C, D, and E. These are just some random genes that are on the bacterial chromosome. And so you notice the first thing that gets transferred is the gene that is nearest to the integration site, which is capital A, and then the capital B as well. And so you're transferring a large amount of DNA from one cell to another. However, the size of the chromosome is so big, so you know, remember, you know, when you have a plasmid, you're only talking about 50 kb. When you're talking about a chromosome, now we're in the order of four megabases. So there's four million base pairs versus 50 kb. And so eventually something goes wrong and this process actually stops. And so instead of transferring uh, the entire chromosome, you're only transferring a piece of the chromosome. And then finally, you, you end the process of conjugation. So this is depicted here. So you can see that in the F minus cell, um, the F minus cell has its intact chromosome, so its original chromosome, but it now has a piece of DNA um, that exactly matches part of the chromosome, with the exception of any sort of allelic differences between them. And so that's why it's little a and little b. So the genes are the same, but there's probably some sort of nucleotide variation between the HFR cell and the F minus cell. So we designate that as capital A and capital B. And so now we have the question of what happens to that in the DNA. So we know that um, DNA has to be circular, typically, to be replicated. Um, bacteria cell, so linear pieces of DNA do not replicate, um, but circular pieces of DNA do. And so, you know, in this situation, this is why the plasma is able to continue to replicate it, because as part of the whole process, after the synthesis occurs, you actually ligate those pieces back together so that you have two circular pieces of DNA. And so it can replicate, and then when cell division occurs, you separate parts of the plasma to different cells, or individual plasmas to different cells. But now we have a linear piece of DNA right here, and so that linear piece of DNA is unable to replicate. And so, you know, you would start out with a cell that has, you know, a chromosome and a linear piece of DNA that kind of matches it. And then let's say you had DNA synthesis occur, you know, you'd have two chromosomes 
and this linear piece of DNA. And so if cell division occurred, you know, you'd have you'd have one bacteria that had the chromosome with no linear piece and one bacteria that had the chromosome with a linear piece. And then if that continues on, you know, this would just create two with a circular chromosome and then with this one divided, you would end up creating one circular and then one circular with linear. So something additionally needs to happen for this piece of DNA that has transferred to have a permanent effect on the offspring of the cell. And this takes advantage of repair processes within the bacteria um, and, and, and it's very similar in nature to what occurs during um, Chapter 5, um, during prophase 1, you know, recombination between homologous chromosomes. Um, so it takes advantage of the fact that there's a very active repair process in bacteria that allows for the genetic exchange of information between a linear piece of DNA and a circular chromosome piece of DNA. So here we've just shown um, the uh, piece, the linear piece of DNA, and now we have the location of two crossovers. And again, you know, this piece of DNA can be large, it can contain multiple genes, and so we have three different genes here, um, Mu plus, Arg plus, and Met plus. And so this donor fragment um, contains wild-type copies of these genes that allow for the protection of the following amino acids. So we've seen arginine and methionine are all the amino acids. But, um, you know, the recipient cell, let's say it's a mutant, and so it has three defective copies of these genes. So this um, cell, this particular bacteria strain, um, is unable to synthesize those three um, amino acids. So if you want to grow this, it has to be grown on minimal media supplemented with leucine um, plus arginine plus methionine. And So now we have the opportunity to exchange the gene from the donor linear cell. And so, you know, the linear piece of DNA, if we followed it along, it would be mu minus R plus met plus, and then you just end up with this linear piece of DNA. So that eventually gets trashed. But the circular chromosome has been transformed so that it would go from the mu plus to R minus um, to met minus. And so the new genotype would result in the transformation of the new gene specifically, and that would basically just determine by where the crossovers occurred. So you can also have crossovers that occur here and here, for example. And so in that case, the transformation of the chromosome uh, would result in the transformation of two different genes. So both mu minus and arg minus would be transformed to the wild type, type copies. So this individual, after undergoing this genetic exchange, would only need methionine supplemented in minimal media in order to grow. And then a final location that you can look at, you know, is something like this, and now we've transformed all three of those. And so, you know, there's a lot of randomness and flexibility to where these crossovers occur, and what exactly gets transformed is determined by the location of where those crossovers. So it's kind of similar, to think about back to chapter five, you know, there's a lot of randomness to where crossover occurs, and the same process is going on in the bacteria cells. And so this is an example of a double crossover. So all of these are double crossovers um, because there are two different locations where the genetic exchange occurs. And so the reason for that is that um, if you only had a single crossover, you know, what you would happen is that if you followed this along, you would eventually uh, create a single linear piece of DNA. Um, and so that would result, you know, the cell would die because it would only have a linear piece of DNA and it could not replicate. And so the cell ensures that there's an even number of crossovers. Um, but you could also have a quadruple crossover. So you can't have three crossovers because the same problem would occur. Um, but you can have four crossovers, for example. And so now we see the location of four different X's. So what happens to this cell? Um, so this cell, you start here, the circular chromosome you know, goes to Lu plus, so we transform the leucine gene. Um, but we go back to normal, so the arginine minus remains the same. And then we go back to the net plus 
um, so we transform the defining gene, and then we go back to the circular, and then that actually eventually wraps around to the to the original piece. So you know, this case, you, you've exchanged two genes on either side of the arginine without without actually affecting the arginine gene. So this is an example of um, how genetic exchange can occur between um, a linear piece of DNA. Um, that got inserted from the HFR strain and the, and the host chromosome. Um, so there's no plasma that's produced in this process. Um, you know, you'll note that you know, the, the plasmid itself is not actually transferred. And the other thing that's important about this process is that you don't actually convert the F- cell into an HFR cell. Um, and that's because you have not transferred the entire piece of the F plasmid. Um, so, you know, if we, if we look at the piece that actually gets where, where it starts, you're starting from the end of the F factor, the end of the F plasma DNA, um, but you're not going to make it, you'd have to transfer this entire piece, this entire host chromosome to wind yourself back up in order to include everything that's part of the F plasma. And, and so for that reason, um, you don't actually, uh, you know, you don't actually ligate this piece. So, like, in order to ligate it, you need the whole the whole F plasmid. So this linear piece never becomes circular, and then you actually don't have all of the genes that are necessary for encoding and creating the nucleus. Um, so this this recipient cell has transformed its DNA, you know, through this process, um, but it is not able to actually create coli and undergo future genetic exchange. So just to summarize that information, so HFR is a special class of F plus cells um, where the plasma has integrated into the chromosome. Um, the HFR strain donates genetic information to the F minus cell, um, but the recipient does not become F plus. Um, it remains F minus. Um, in contrast to when you, when you have F plus crossed with F minus, the recipient becomes F plus. But when you have an HFR strain crossed with an F minus, the recipient remains F minus. The other thing that's important for this process, you know, when you transfer a plasmid um, to a bacteria species, uh, different bacteria species, you know, in general, the, the plasmid is pretty independent, so it can replicate in you know, a large variety of, of bacterial species. And so the genetic distance, the evolutionary distance between the two species can actually be quite large. Um, and so that you can have a way for, you know, uh, bacteria bacteria that are extremely different from each other to, to receive DNA, you know, through this, through this plasma exchange. So in this case, you, need, you rely on recombination. And so there must be enough similarity um, between the, the DNA, the donor DNA and the recipient DNA, where you can actually pair up, you know, the DNA together because there's enough similarity that you can, you can um, align these kind of together. All right, so what was learned by this process? So one of the things um, that people have done is they have used HFR strains in order to study the order um, of DNA on the cell, in the, on the chromosome, um, and uh, they were able to actually um, demonstrate that the uh, bacteria um, have a circular chromosome. And so they did this through this, um, these interrupted mating experiments. Um, so they cultured a mixture of HFR strains and F- strains um, and allowed them to transfer DNA for a set amount of time. And then they put these, these in a blender, and the force of the blender um, interrupted the conjugation. So it stopped conjugation after, after a defined period of time. Um, so you, you add HFR and F- and mix them all up. You let it go for 30 minutes, let's say, you put it in a blender, and then you study the, the, the transformation that has occurred um, in the HFR, in, sorry, in the F minus frame. So let's just see an explicit example of this and how it is used for determining gene order. So we have our HFR strain. Um, so this original HFR strain um, has the plasmid integrated at a specific location in the chromosome, which is shown right here. Uh, and then we're also showing four different genes um, kind of on the chromosome. And so this origin of transfer determines where the start is. Um, so the start is right here. And then you basically transfer kind of in this direction. Sorry, that's the wrong direction. Uh, where is this? 
Um, so in this case, the origin is right here. And then you transfer the DNA to the recipient cell in this direction. So this is where the origin is, and then the orange gene gets transferred first, then the purple, the, the orange, and the green. And so here we have four different genes. So the HFR strain, you will notice that the HFR strain and the F minus strain have different alleles at all four of these genes. So this is resistant um, to sodium azide. Uh, this is resistant to TON, which the phenotype of TON escapes me in this moment. Um, LAC plus, so this can grow on the lactose sugar. And this is GAL plus, um, which can grow in the um, galactose sugar. And so even this is, this is drawn so that they looks like they're kind of distributed throughout the chromosome. You know, you should think of these four genes as being very close together. Um, so it's more like, you know, the locations of these four is kind of like this, where they're all pretty close to the origin of transfer. And then finally, you have this fifth strain, uh, sorry, this fifth gene, um, which in, uh, encodes streptomycin sensitivity. Um, so the HFR strain will die if you add streptomycin, which is an antibiotic, and this strain will live if you do. And so the purpose of this is that this is unlinked. So, you know, this is AZ, TON, LAC, and GAL. Um, this streptomycin is somewhere really far away um, so that it never actually gets transferred into the recipient cell. Um, so you know that this recipient cell is going to be strep resistant no matter what. And so what this does is after the mixture, so you, you mix the DNA, you've interrupted the conjugation by putting it in a blender, and now you want to have a way to get rid of all of these cells, all of the HFR cells, because you want to study specifically what has happened in the F minus cell. And so you take advantage of this marker right here in order to kill all of the HFR cells by plating these on streptomycin plates, plates that contain streptomycin. So this particular experiment has been done where the interruption has occurred at 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25, 30, 40, and 50, and 60 minutes. And now we're just studying what happens to the genotypes of these cells um, as, uh, as you allow more and more DNA to be transferred. And so what you'll find is that the closest gene um, starts to transform first. So because, you know, you're transporting this DNA, this DNA takes time. You know, initially you transform the, transport the origin of transfer, and then it takes approximately 10 minutes um, to reach the AZI gene, um, which encodes sodium azide resistance, um, for that to actually make it into the cell. And so after 10 minutes, you're seeing a small subset of this gene transforming in the F minus cell. And then as you allow it to happen a little bit longer, you know, after 15 minutes, approximately 70% of those cells have transformed um, from the original sensitivity, so now they're resistant due to the recombination between this piece of DNA. The gene that is next closest, the TON, that is the next one to transform. And so you see at 15 minutes, you start to see a little bit, and 30% of the cells have that, and then so on and so forth. And so you, know, you see basically this order um, where the farther away the gene is from the origin of transfer, um, the longer it takes in order to actually transform. And so the order of the genes would be AZI, TON, LAC, and then GAL. And you'll also notice it's not only when it starts to transform, um, but also kind of the total amount of, of uh, transformation that has occurred. That also, you know, instead of going up to 100%, you know, these kind of max out at 40% or 20%, and that's just due to the distance of how far they are from the original transfer. Um, so, you know, experimenters have done time mapping in order to, to map the location of different genes that they were studying and determine how close they were. And this process served as the basis for the first genetic map of E. coli. And so, by combining a number of HFR strains, um, they're eventually able to show the order of genes on the chromosome and also determine that they're actually circular. And so what do I mean by that? Well, here's an example of four different HFR strains. And the difference between these HFR strains is where the, um, the F-factor DNA is integrated. So in one case, you have it here. 
one case we have it here, so in between the thi and the uh, CHR gene, here between the leucine and the lizide gene, here between the, um, the lactose and the proline gene, and then here between the pro and the tan gene. And so this, you know, the location of this DNA can not only change, but also the orientation can change as well. Um, and so this is kind of what this semicircle shows you, um, kind of the direction of DNA that gets ordered first. So it can either be in the clockwise, the counterclockwise direction, um, or the counterclockwise direction. So we have counterclockwise, clockwise, 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 and that's determined by kind of the orientation of the F plasmid. It can kind of orient, it, orient in two different directions. And so the origin of transfer is either on this side or it's on the kind of the opposite side instead. And so if you do these, these exper experiments um, to order the genes, you know, basically this allows you to figure out the order of transfer for these four different strains. So for this strain, um, sorry, it looks like I got this the opposite, so the direction goes this way. Um, so this is the first piece of DNA that gets transferred. And so it's THR, then LU, then Azide, then TAN, then PRO, then LAP, then GAL, then THI. And then um, the LU, the, so for this one right here, you know, the direction is the opposite. So you'll notice that, um, uh, the Lu, Thur, Thai, Gal, Lap, Proton, AZI. And so we also do this for this one right here. This starts at Pro, Ton, AZI, Lu, um, Thur, Thai, Gal, Lap. And so, you know, one thing you'll notice is that um, the order is the same. So, Pro, Ton, AZI, Pro, Ton, AZI. Um, and then in the third case, uh, and then it starts back over here, Tom and ACI. Um, but that order is dependent upon the orientation, so it can also be the opposite. So you notice here in this screen, which has the opposite orientation, is pro Tom and ACI. And so this also is able to, to demonstrate that it's circular. Um, so in this case, you know, you started with Tom first um, and pro last. Um, and that's simply because, you know, it had to go all the way around to reach back to the pro, okay? Um, but in this case, you know, they were able to do the um, pro ton AZI kind of just the location. And so the interpretation of that, the way you interpret that data, is to say that the DNA is actually circular, and so um, there's no kind of linear end. So you would expect if there's a linear end of the chromosome, like, all of them would have to stop on one of the genes. So they might all stop on THR, um, and that wasn't observed. So instead, what is observed is able to do, you know, the entire thing no matter what. And so that showed that both the order of the genes on the chromosome, and then also that the DNA was actually circular. All right, so we've talked now about two different processes of conjugation, where either plasmid DNA is transferred from one cell to the other, um, or um, uh, chromosomal DNA is transferred from one to the other. And we talked a little bit about how useful it can be to transfer plasmid DNA from one cell to the other. Um, but in general, the, the genes that we talked about um, that were on this plasmid were just, you know, necessary for, for fertility. So pili genes, things for creating the things that were necessary. And so, you know, it seems like it would be good to also be able to transfer additional DNA on that plasmid. Um, so if this genome, if this genome right here contains some sort of useful segment of DNA, um, you know, we know how we can transfer this segment of DNA onto the chromosome of a related species. But we also might want to be able to transfer this DNA into, you know, a species on the plasmid. So is there a way to get this DNA onto the plasmid? And there is, in fact. And so that's kind of what motivates the idea of this F prime state of a merozygote. Um, and so it's an F factor that has integrated to create an HFR screen, but then it has popped out. 
So it has gone from an HFR strain back to an F prof plus state. And we call this F prime. Um, an F prime behaves like F plus, so it initiates conjugation in the same way, but it also includes some additional DNA. And that's because of an imperfect process um, for this plasmid popping out. Um, so when you excise this X, X, this F factor um, from the chromosome, you also might take some pieces of DNA that were originally part of the E. coli chromosome and also include that into the chromosome. And so you'll see this F factor has the entire blue part that encodes all of the fertility factors, all the stuff necessary for pili, you know, for transferring DNA, for replicating DNA, for ligating it back together into a circular copy. But now it contains an additional amount of DNA um, and that's designated as the capital A, capital E. And so let's say this cell, this F prime cell, finds itself another F minus cell, you know, it creates a conjugation, um, and then it transfers the plasmid um, from one cell to the other, um, and then eventually that plasmid ligates back together. And so let's look at this F prime cell right here. Um, so this is now converted to an F prime cell because it's now a fertile cell because it has all of this plasmid. So this is the recipient cell that originally did not, that, that, that was an F minus cell. Um, and now you'll notice that it has two copies of the A gene and the E gene. And there's probably going to be some sort of a real variation between them. And so this is what we call a merozygote, and it's also commonly called a merodiploid mero cell. Um, and, and, and essentially what we created is a diploid cell. Um, so similar to like a human cell is diploid, where you have two copies of every single gene. Um, you can create a bacterial cell that is a merodiploid that's partially diploid at some of the genes. And so this would be merodiploid for the A gene and the E gene. And so we've allowed this plasmid to become a little bit more useful where it can now transfer DNA um, uh, from, from the host cell to the recipient cell, but that, ho that new DNA does not actually have to integrate into the chromosome to stick around. So the cell will be able to replicate both the original chromosome as well as the plasmid because both of these are circular, uh, circular pieces of DNA. So the F factor is an example of a plasmid, double-stranded closed circles of DNA. They exist, exist in multiple copies in the cytoplasm. Um, they contain one and almost always, always more than one gene, um, so they encode a large number of genes, um, and different types of plasmid exist. So almost always these plasmid encodes whatever is necessary to replicate and divide the plasmid, and, and oftentimes allow it to transfer. Um, and these are all very important parts of the spread of antibiotic resistance. Um, so this section is getting a little long, but I'm just going to end with um, transformation. So transformation, as you've been following along um, with, with the whole um, transduction, I'm sorry, the whole conjugation um, part of the, the lecture, especially on the HFR screen, uh, pretty much essentially everything we're going to talk about with transformation is following along with that with just a little bit of a variation on how the DNA gets into the cell. Um, so again, you have a host cell, and uh, so you have a recipient cell. And so this recipient cell um, you know, previously received DNA through a bridge, the pillus bridge, but now we're going to suppose that this recipient cell actually is able to just import DNA from, from the environment. And so it can do that because it actually has receptors. It has genes that encode receptors that can bind to DNA in the extracellular space. And so if you have like a large piece of DNA in the extracellular space, so that would be like within the water, you know, um, you know the common place that this happens is actually um, in vibrio. So Brian Hammer's lab at um, Georgia Tech studied this process in detail. You have bacteria that live. Um, on chitin shells, like on crab shells or something like this, in close association. And so if one of those lice, they release DNA into the environment, and then the, the vibrio cells that are also on the, the cell, on the crab shell, um, will actually be able to take up that DNA into their, into their cytoplasm. And so the DNA actually gets transported into the cell. The double strands separate, and one of those is degraded. And so now we have a very similar process as before. We have a linear piece of DNA, 
Um, and this linear piece of DNA can actually transform the host chromosome in the same way as before. So if you have a double crossover event or a quadruple cross crossover event, um, then you actually have genetic exchange between the host chromosome and that linear piece of DNA. And so that host is able to um, actually transform its chromosome, you know, in, in this way. So just there's two steps of transformation. So in order for this to have an effect on the cell, um, first foreign DNA has to enter into the recipient cell. Um, so there has to be DNA in the environment. The recipient cell has to be able to import that into the cell. And then the second thing is that um, uh, recombination um, must also occur between the linear piece of DNA and then the homologous region of the recipient chromosome. So again, there has to be homology between the pieces. Um, so this works better when the species are somewhat closely related. And then if you complete both cells, you've actually transformed um, the chromosome um, to have a new allele um, on it. And then eventually that linear piece will just be lost. And then co-transformation just kind of refers to the process when multiple genes are transformed um, simultaneously. You know, genes are close, and, close enough together to be linked. Um, so if you had a single segment of 10,000 to 20,000 base pairs of DNA, you know, most likely that would encode multiple genes. Um, that linear piece of DNA would encode multiple genes. And so co-transformation just, you know, refers to the situation where um, you know, in this case, for example, two of the genes were transformed that were next to each other. All right, so that is the end of part two, and we will move on to um, phages and DNA exchange through phases, phages next.